a Sinn Féin victory makes history. For the first time in more than a century, the Irish nationalists triumph in parliamentary elections. So why have unionists lost support? And what could it mean for the future of Northern Ireland and the Republic? I'm Andrea Sankey, and today's newsmaker is Sinn Féin. It was described as a defining moment for Belfast. Sinn Féin has for decades pushed for a unified Ireland. Now, after winning the most seats in Parliament, could their century-old dream become a reality? When asked what the victory could mean for Ireland's chances of reunification, Michelle O'Neill, who's in line to become the next First Minister, said this. Well, I'm very pleased to report that there is a very healthy conversation already underway and I've always said throughout the election campaign that regardless of the outcome of the election, that conversation was going to continue. Those of us that are for unification will make that case. I encourage those that actually don't have that perspective at this moment in time to also enter into the conversation. Let's have a healthy debate about what our future looks like, something that's better for each and every one of us. While a healthy conversation may be underway, Sinn Féin will still struggle to achieve that united Ireland. Despite winning a majority in Parliament, they will still have to share power with the Democratic Unionists. And the two have vastly different visions for Northern Ireland. Sinn Féin wants unification. The DUP wants to remain a constituent country of the United Kingdom. And that's just one obstacle among many. As Democrats, the DUP, but also the British government, must accept the, and respect the democratic outcome of this election. Brinkmanship will not be tolerated where the north of Ireland becomes collateral damage in a game of chicken with the European Commission. The responsibility for finding solutions to the protocol to make its smooth implementation lie with Boris Johnson and the EU. But make no mistake, we and our business community here will not be held to ransom. Sinn Féin was well aware they'd be facing major challenges after this election. Before exploring those, let's first take a look at some key moments in the party's history. In 1905, Sinn Féin was founded. The party gained prominence in 1916 when its members were heavily involved in the Easter Rebellion. That's when Irish Republicans staged an armed insurrection against British rule in Ireland, which gave way to the Irish War of Independence. Now, in 1921, the war came to an end after Sinn Féin negotiated the Anglo-Irish Treaty with the British government. The deal led to the creation of Northern Ireland, separate from the Irish Republic. But later came the Troubles, a three-decade-long period of sectarian violence starting in 1968. The Northern Ireland Civil Rights Association held a protest in Derry claiming discrimination against nationalists. Police used excessive force to break up the march, provoking a spate of serious violence. In 1998, the Troubles finally came to an end after the Unionists and Nationalists signed the Good Friday Agreement. But then Brexit happened, and fears of renewed unrest rose again. Northern Ireland is the only part of the UK that shares a border with an EU nation. Now, before Brexit, they shared the same trade rules, but when the UK left the EU, those rules changed. To address that, the controversial Northern Ireland Protocol was introduced. To avoid a hard border between Northern Ireland and the Republic, goods would not be checked at the Irish land border, but instead, at a new border in the Irish Sea between Northern Ireland and Great Britain. That's something unionists say undermines Northern Ireland's place in the UK. And now, after signing off on that protocol, Boris Johnson's government is looking at ways to change it or even back out. Uh, I am clear. We will uh, nominate to the executive as soon as the government takes decisive action to deal with the protocol. The man with the stopwatch is Brandon Lewis. The people who can deliver the change uh, are Boris Johnson and the government. We are very clear about that. Frankly, the sooner they do it, the sooner we can get things properly functioning again here at Stormont. That is what is, I want. Well, joining me now to discuss how Sinn Féin got here and the future of Northern Ireland are from Dublin. Niall O'Donoghue, he is a Sinn Féin senator and former mayor of Belfast. Also from Dublin is Northern Irish journalist and broadcaster Susan McKay. And from London, Dennis McShane, the former UK Minister for Europe. Thanks all so much for being with us. Susan, I'm going to start with you. If you can sum up 
uh, the progression of, of how Sinn Féin got to this point, you know, starting mostly from the Brexit vote, because many argue prior to that, this win you know, could have been impossible. Um, yes, uh, I think that the br Brexit has very, very deeply destabilized the Good Friday Agreement. And that has led to a lot of people feeling that Northern Ireland is pretty much being disregarded within the UK uh, because there was a majority, a substantial majority of people in Northern Ireland voted to remain in the EU. But that was obviously not counted. Uh, we were taken out of the EU. And uh, I think that made a lot of people think, well, there is a route back into the UK which is, or into, the, into Europe, which is by way of being part of a united Ireland. So that turned a certain corner for people. And also, I think just the, the um, general behaviour of the British government in favouring the DUP over all of the other parties in Northern Ireland um, created an atmosphere where people felt, you know, this is, this is just, this form of democracy is just not working for people. And that has obviously made people gravitate towards Sinn Féin. But also demographically, the nationalist community is growing and uh, more and more people are obviously turning to Sinn Féin because they no longer see any point in voting for the smaller parties. The same thing has happened oh. on the unionist side where you see um, people, instead of voting for the smaller unionist parties, have been voting just for the DUP, the Democratic Unionist Party. So it's come down to being very much the Republican Party, the, Dem the Unionist Party, and then we now, with this election, see the interesting uh, involvement of the other party, which is the Alliance Party. Uh, your, your viewers may know that under the Good Friday Agreement, um, parties in Northern Ireland have to designate as either being nationalist, unionist or other. And uh, Sinn Féin obviously is nationalist. Uh, the DUP is unionist oh. and alliance constitutes as other. So we've now got the three, these three big parties with the other parties very far behind them. Okay. Niall, I want to get your sentiments uh, on, on the same question there. And also tell us for those uh, who are still supporting the unionists, why are they still so attached to the UK? I suppose it's difficult for me to answer that, not being uh, a unionist, and I do, like I'm sure a lot of your viewers wonder why uh, they would be uh, and have such affinity to a union which quite clearly doesn't consider their needs, doesn't consider their wishes, and doesn't work uh, in their best interests, and that's evidenced uh, in Brexit uh, most acutely. And I mean, it's also, as Susan Radley pointed out, uh, the reality that a majority of people in the north of Ireland voted uh, to remain in the EU, and at the heart of the Good Friday Agreement, which was an international uh, peace accord, which was a compromise, uh, and which in, uh, involved international players, including the EU, at the heart of that agreement was the issue of consent. The reality is that no one has consented uh, to Brexit here in Ireland. So it has changed uh, the political dynamic. Um, it has changed uh, the electoral dynamic, as we have uh, seen uh, in the course uh, of last week. And I think there is an increasing number uh, of people within the unionist community who feel maybe more detached from their affinity uh, with Britain uh, than they would have uh, 5, 10, 15 uh, years ago. And it's, uh, I suppose, most represented in the form uh, of, of Brexit. They didn't want to leave uh, the EU. They have been taken out of the EU against their will in the same way that I, as an Irish and EU citizen, have, and they have lost a whole swathe of entitlements uh, and rights and protections that would have been afforded to them. So, uh, again, as Susan has said, uh, the uniqueness uh, and I said, the great strength of the Good Friday Agreement is that it affords us a pathway back to the European Union, and that has been made clear by the EU Council. Um, um, that under the terms of the Good Friday Agreement, a reunified Ireland would re-enter uh, as a full member of the European Union. So people within unionism may not be, you know, coming out uh, as strong Irish Republicans in the way that I am, uh, but nevertheless, they value their European citizenship, they value what the EU gives to them, and they resent the fact that the British government uh, not only have taken them out of the EU against their will, but have made such uh, a flaming disaster uh, in doing so. There is a, a progression, uh, as I said earlier here, uh, that's been moving this way, especially since the Brexit vote. But there are certain institutions, Niall, I'll stay with you on this, um, that some Northern Irish uh, unionists still hold very dear. 
The NHS, for example, it might sound trivial somewhat on the larger scale, but these are British institutions uh, that they didn't ever want to split from because they don't feel that the Republic of Ireland can give them the same kinds of, of historical services that the UK has long provided. Uh, do you think that still factors in today? Well, I want to say in the first instance that I also hold the NHS very dear. I value it. I have availed of it uh, all my life, uh, and it's something that I think uh, going forward in the discussions around planning and preparing for a new Ireland, uh, a reunified Ireland, that our health service, our education service, our justice system, uh, our housing system, all of these uh, issues need to be uh, on the table. It can't be about simply uh, bolting two states uh, onto each other. I think we have to reimagine uh, Ireland. And I think if Brexit has taught us anything, it's that if you go into a referendum, if you go into an issue of such important uh, change and you don't do your homework, uh, you don't do that research, you don't do that engagement, then you will end up uh, with the calamitous uh, results that we're seeing play, playing out in Britain uh, post-Brexit. So I want to see an All-Ireland healthcare service uh, that's free at the point of uh, delivery, that's world class. Um, the sad reality is that after 10 years of Tory austerity, uh, in London, the NHS has been absolutely hollowed out um, mm. in the South, while the system uh, is by no means perfect. Uh, here in the South, more money is spent per head of population on health care. Uh, a lot of people in uh, this jurisdiction actually do avail uh, of free health care. So there's a lot of, uh, I suppose, misunderstanding that comes about as a result uh, of partition and two systems uh, operating uh, parallel, okay. when what we really need to see uh, are better systems, unified systems, mm. working for the welfare and the betterment of everyone. Understood. Uh, Dennis McShane, I saw you shake your head. I couldn't tell if you were disagreeing or agreeing in despair with, with what you were hearing there. I, I was agreeing with much of it. I agree with an awful lot of this. But surely what we've seen, you can't start this in June 2016. This century, Britain, the British Isles, all of us, uh, England, Scotland. I was born in Scotland. I have an Irish passport. I grew up educated in England, was a British uh, English MP for an English seat. What we've seen is the most extraordinary testbed experiment of the new nationalisms, mm. starting with Scotland, which rejects the idea of union with England and Northern Ireland, then starting with Tory England, rejecting the idea of union with other nations in the European Union. And of course, Sinn Féin, absolutely historically going right back, all honour to it, it's never made any, played any games on its identity, rejecting any union of the British Isles for the sake of Irish nationalism. And very often in the past, uh, if I may say so, a very Catholic nationalism, just as the Stormont Parliament uh, in Belfast was described as a Protestant parliament for a Protestant people. So overhanging all of this is religious identity as well. Now, that's my problem. I want a European identity. I'm not interested in Scottish nationalism, English nationalism or Irish nationalism, but it must be said the nationalisms are driving the moderates to one side. There's no other voice in Scotland, barely, other than strident nationalism. Sinn Féin did extremely well uh, in Northern Ireland last Thursday and is doing very well in the Republic. Okay. And the other moderate parties just have stopped existing. And it's a big fight in England whether Boris Johnson, Donald Trump-type nationalism conquers or we and the other parties, I don't just speak for Labour, can bring Britain back mm. to being a more moderately governed nation. OK, but uh, let me ask you about... You know, you say Tory England was what rejected the EU, but what about Tory England quietly rejecting the UK? Do you think English voters really care about the well, union at this point? I mean, some polls say they actually wanted Brexit more than Scotland and Northern Ireland in the union. Oh, uh, I think that's of the most profound Im Im importance. Mm. And Boris Johnson's platinum jubilee gift to Her Majesty may well be, sorry, ma'am, I'm going to disunite your United Kingdom. It's extremely dangerous territory we're all in, but because Britain, sorry, the England first, then the UK, then Great Britain, has been a very stable, settled state for centuries, people don't understand the deep undercurrents that are going 
on. But you're absolutely right. Uh, often enough, you will fight. And, and uh, you know, there are people on the left who say it as well. Well, who cares about Northern Ireland? For God's sake, look at them. They've never been able to live with... Let, let them go into the Republic. Let them mess each other up. Let, who cares about Scotland that much? We have to pay. I, as a taxpayer in London, I pay to keep the Scottish uh, economy and public services functioning. I don't mind that, because in every world, Germany, America, the better off bits of the country help the poorer bits of, of the nation. Okay. But uh, indeed, Brexit is the, it's, it's the one thing that we don't like discussing at the, in London. The BBC won't discuss it, the main papers won't discuss it, but Brexit has cha is changing, not has changed, is changing everything, not the least the current crisis, this insane idea while when Europe and England and Ireland and the United States are all uniting to stand up against Putin's aggression, uh, the English Prime Minister is saying to the United States and Europe, drop dead, I'm prepared to rip up the Good Friday Agreement uh, and rip up the treaty between Britain and the European Union, again, for the sake of national identity, in this case, as expressed by the DUP. OK. Uh, Susan, I want to get your thoughts on that, uh, especially the issue of national identity. And if, if you can speak to, you know, the role that it's playing across the Republic and Northern Ireland. Um, there used to be a much strong, go ahead. I'd say that there, there's a huge difference between the nationalisms which exist in Scotland and Ireland and the, the very shrill, very strident English nationalism which is driving this current government, uh, which is actually leading to the breakup of the United Kingdom. But I, th I think that what, um, I think it's it's a mistake uh, for Dennis to say that um, the government, the British government, is doing what it's doing in the interests of the national identity of the DUP. I think the DUP would like to think that, but I think actually what the British government is doing is using the DUP as a proxy in its own battle with the, the EU. It suits the uh, British government to say, well, look, we are protecting the Good Friday Agreement. Uh, you're running rampage through it uh, with the protocol. That isn't actually the view yeah. of most of the, the parties in Northern Ireland which actually support the Good Friday Agreement. It's important to say that the DUP is highly ambivalent about the Good Friday Agreement. Uh, Jeffrey Donaldson himself left a pro-agreement party to join the DUP when it was anti-agreement and he's recently aligned himself with a lot of extremely anti-Good Friday Agreement unionists. So I think what's going on is not necessarily what both the DUP and the British government are saying it is. Um, I think that a lot of people in Northern Ireland now feel that Northern Ireland just can't work as a state because the unionist parties just haven't proved themselves willing to share it. And I think that goes for a lot of people who have also joined the Alliance Party, which doesn't take a position on the national question as it's known in Ireland. I think that there are people there who are open to the idea of remaining in the UK, but also open to the idea of uh, joining a united Ireland. Uh, Niall, if I can move on with you to kind of a related thread. You know, those are there are those who downplay Sinn Féin's victory, uh, even, you know, comparing it to Scottish nationalists and that are in power saying that, OK, they've been there for quite a while now and nothing's actually fundamentally changed in Scotland. But do you think they're ignoring the progression and the fact that history has now shown how quickly change can come as it did in the case of Brexit? Well, I, I do think change can come, and change in our own instance here in Ireland is provided for in the Good Friday Agreement. Uh, I mean, the Good Friday Agreement and the British and Irish governments have signed up to this, they're co-guarantors of this, and, and the agreement has now more than come of age, uh, almost 25 years uh, after 1998. There is the provision for uh, a referendum uh, on constitutional change, and certainly, uh, regardless uh, of what's happening you know, uh, across the water in, in Scotland or indeed uh, in Tory England. Uh, what we are advocating for is that the Irish government would begin the process uh, of planning 
uh, of informing, of engaging, of researching how mm -hmm. constitutional change could come about, how it could be managed, and how there could be a space and provision for people of a unionist and British identity to retain those important uh, symbols uh, that they hold dear, whether that's the British monarchy or whether that's uh, some of the uh, loyal orders and marching institutions. Uh, so the debate is live. The debate uh, is perhaps being drowned out to an international audience because of what's happening around Brexit and the protocol. But certainly here in Ireland, North and South, uh, there is a live debate involving academia, involving politics, involving civic society and the trade union movement okay. about uh, our constitutional change and planning for uh, a united Ireland. Uh, so that debate, need, that debate needs a home. Uh, and we certainly in Sinn Féin are advocating that the Irish government would convene a citizens' assembly, uh, a forum for that debate for that research so we can navigate in a sensible, in a responsible, in uh, a leaderly way uh, for that constitutional change when it comes about. Right. Uh, you've, you've stressed uh, a few times now that the Good Friday Agreement does provide uh, for this, you know, potentially just in the form of a referendum. Uh, but tell me a time scale. What does your instinct tell you about when any of this could possibly happen? Well, I, I want the referendum to happen, but I want it to happen in an orderly uh, and in a proper way. I want to win the referendum, uh, to put it bluntly. Uh, I do think, and our party president, Mary Lou Macdonald, has referred to as being in the decade uh, of opportunity. So I do believe uh, within this decade we are going to see uh, important fundamental constitutional change. But again, uh, I don't want to run heavy-handed, heavy-headed into that. I want to ensure uh, that we have done the maximum amount of preparation, the maximum okay. amount of engagement with those of a different uh, view, and the maximum amount of planning uh, and preparing. Dennis, why is this laughable to you? It's not laughable. I, I think that's being incredibly sincere. I entirely respect his point of view. And a peaceful unification of, of Ireland, like a peaceful withdrawal from the Ukraine, would be a jolly good thing. Uh, all I have to say is that I came into Parliament, the English House of Commons, I mean, in 1994, and already people were calling for a referendum on leaving Europe. Everybody laughed at it. And then David Cameron said it would happen. And I wrote a book published in 2014 called Brexit, How Britain Will Leave Europe. Because a populist plebiscite, they are not peace-loving, kumbaya, sit around, all agree, chant poems, agree uh, wonderful things. They ple Referendums, plebiscites are the most bitterly contested political processes known in any uh, democracy. So are and you I'll saying you don't think it can happen in an orderly manner in no, Ireland? No, no, no. I, orderly, yes. I mean, okay. respectfully, there'll be debates, but trust me, it will be divisive, it will be difficult, and sincerely to Niall, I'd say, because when I wrote my book saying Brexit, how Britain will leave Europe, every member of the all the elites, the civil service, the politicians, Labour, Cameron, Ed Miliband, the newspapers, mm -hmm. I couldn't get on the BBC to discuss it, said, you're talking rubbish, Dennis. Of course we're not going to vote ourselves out of Europe. And then two years later, we did. So that's my little contribution, friend, okay. fraternal and friendly advice. I may be too old and gone by the time there's a referendum in Ireland. Be very careful for what you wish. Okay, Susan, I, I saw you had a comment. I have one last question for you, but go ahead. I just want to say we're, we're uh, maybe a bit more sophisticated than you think about referendums in Ireland, Dennis. Um, we've had a lot of referendums in Ireland in recent mm, years. True. Yeah, we've true. had referendums on European treaties. We've had referendums on marriage equality for, for gay people. And we've had referendums on abortion rights. We've had referendums on very and contentious and issues. They've been very positive, and, they actually. Been, and they've been conducted in a very sensible way. But, but uh, Susan, have, well, may I? Can, may I, Susan? So may I just 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 say on some of the treaty referendums you've had to vote twice and you won't get a second vote it's either unity with the north which I would vote for or it's a rejection of that and you can't come back as you did on at least two of the previous treaties and have a second bite of the cherry I fought for a second referendum in England but I knew in my heart of hearts it wasn't going to happen. Again, this is just English experience. Well, I think as uh, I think that Niall already said, we've watched the disaster that Britain made of well, Brexit. Uh, I... We've learned a lot about how to do this kind of momentous okay. referendum okay. from that.
Susan, <laughs> if I can interrupt at this point, we just have a one minute left, and I wanted to ask you this because you had alluded to yeah, it a couple Susan times. Yeah, Susan says. Uh, very quickly, Susan, if I can stick with you, just how much yes. uh, social movements that you referred to have changed mm -hmm. the tide here? LGBTQ rights, uh, women's rights, um, you know, the Republic of Ireland really is, is no longer the Catholic state uh, that it used exactly. to be. And how much has exactly. that changed the entire I, landscape today? I think it has changed everything. I think it's a really important question. It has changed the Republic of Ireland, but it's also changed the attitude of many people in the North towards the Republic. A lot of young people in the North were involved in helping out with the campaigns for social change in the Republic. And they now see that you can change Ireland, not necessarily just through political means, that social movements can be very, very powerful. And they identify with the social changes that have taken place in the Republic. And I think that that, in you know, many ways, many people have already broken down the border. They're already working on a cross-border basis on bringing about change in Ireland. And that is really, really important. And that is key, you are right. Uh, Susan McKay, you're going to have to get the last word there because we are completely unfortunate, uh, out of time uh, for this edition of the Newsmakers. I'd like to thank Niall Donnell Yee and uh, Dennis McShane as well for being with us and our viewers, of course. Remember, you can subscribe to our YouTube channel. Please do. I'm Andrea Sankey, and we'll see you next time.